From the floor of the United Nations, a thaw in frozen U.S.-Iranian relations. On Inside Story, the challenges and ripple effects of this new diplomatic opening. Hello and welcome, I'm Thomas Drayden. President Barack Obama and President Hassan Rouhani did not meet face to face at the opening of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. But in separate speeches, the two leaders talked optimistically and cautiously about the prospects for further dialogue. On Thursday, Secretary of State John Kerry is scheduled to hold talks with his Iranian counterpart Mohammad Javad Zarif. It will be the highest level meeting between the two countries since 1979. Among the many issues the two will have to work through, Iran's nuclear program and Syria's raging war. President Obama said the difficult history between the United States and Iran cannot be overcome overnight because the suspicion runs too deep. I do believe that if we can resolve the issue of Iran's nuclear program, that can serve as a major step down a long road towards a different relationship one based on mutual interests and mutual respect. The Islamic Republic of Iran, insisting on the implementation of its rights and the imperative of international respect and cooperation in this exercise, is prepared to engage immediately in time-bound and result-oriented talks to build mutual confidence and removal of mutual uncertainties with full transparency. We are not seeking regime change. And we respect the right of the Iranian people to access peaceful nuclear energy. Instead, we insist that the Iranian government meet its responsibilities under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and UN Security Council resolutions. Now, meanwhile, the Supreme Leader has issued a fatwa against the development of nuclear weapons. And President Rouhani has just recently reiterated that the Islamic Republic will never develop a nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapon and other weapons of mass destruction have no place in Iran's security and defense doctrine and contradict our fundamental religious and ethical convictions. So these statements made by our respective governments should offer the basis for a meaningful agreement. We should be able to achieve a resolution that respects the rights of the Iranian people while giving the world confidence that the Iranian program is peaceful. But to succeed, conciliatory words will have to be matched by actions that are transparent and verifiable. After all, it's the Iranian government's choices that have led to the comprehensive sanctions that are currently in place. <laughs> These sanctions are violent, pure and simple, whether called smart or otherwise, unilateral or multilateral. These sanctions violate inalienable human rights, inter alia, the right to peace, right to development, right to access to health and education, and above all, the right to life. Sanctions beyond any and all rhetoric cause belligerence, warmongering, and human suffering. For more on the prospects for diplomacy between the U.S. and Iran, we're joined from Tehran by Gunbar Nadiri. He is an Iranian journalist and commentator and works at Kehan International, an English language daily under the supervision of the Supreme Leader. Here in the studio, we have Ambassador John Limbert. He is the former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iran. And from San Francisco, we're joined by Ali Azetiar. He is the Executive Director of the Berkeley Program in Entrepreneurship and Development in the Middle East. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Thank you. I want to start with the view from Tehran. Gunbar Nadiri, what is the economic situation in Iran right now? Food prices, as you know, have risen 50 percent in just the last year alone. Well, uh, basically, uh, sanctions have affected the economic performance of this country. There is no doubt about it. But let's not forget that the sanctions that have been imposed by Iran by some Western countries are also affecting the, their own economic performances, like France and, and Britain. So 
uh, it is a two-way street. It is not in the best interest of any country. Those who are imposing the sanctions and those who are subject to sanctions. So yes, Iranians are not happy with the economic situation in this country, but I, I don't think, the, I, I think this is also vice versa. Ali Azatiar, resuscitating Iran's dying economy is going to be a daunting challenge here. Oil revenue have fallen, has fallen 58 percent. One out of four people are without a job. Inflation is at 42 percent, and the currency has lost more than half its value. How optimistic are you that change is coming? Well, one thing's for sure. Sanctions alone and the lifting of sanctions will not solve the problem. Iran has a number of structural problems with its economy. Uh, it's a, a dependent on oil revenue. It's dependent on the state. What used to be a small private sector is, is more and more disappearing. Um, it's also mismanaged. A lot of loyalty appointments uh, take place in, in Iran, and a, a number of policies from predecessor governments have failed to bring su successful economic uh, products to the, to the market. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the sanctions contribute to all of that. But without a real sort of uprooting of the nepotism and, and a number of, of, of corrupt sort of elements of the economy, uh, there's very little hope that there'll be lasting economic um, sort of relief for the Iranians. Ambassador Limber, the country is at a rare moment right now where national solidarity is, is at a very high level. How dire is the need to remove international sanctions? It's a good question. I mean, um, I, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Ezatiar. Uh, Iran, with its resources, with its well-educated and creative, pop uh, creative population, uh, should be a paradise. It isn't. They're, they're, su uh, uh, they're suffering. The thing that no one re can know, and no one seems to know, is how much of that is because of the sanctions and how much of it is because of long-term economic mismanagement. That is not a new, prob uh, um, a new problem in Iran. It's been around for, uh, uh, for a long time. What needs to happen moving forward to improve the economy of Iran? Well, I, I can't speak for the, Iran, uh, uh, for the Iranian uh, dec decision makers, uh, but clearly they need to be in the international market. They need to strengthen their strongest, uh, uh, their, their strongest economic sector, which is the petroleum so petroleum sector. They need educa obviously education, infrastructure, all of these things. But the point is, they should be able to do it with the. Uh, population that they have, with the resources that they, with the resources that they have, they sh they should be able to manage this economy and turn their country into something much more prosperous, much more effective than it is today. How do you begin that process, Gunbar Nadiri? What is the the greatest obstacle right now facing Iranians? Well, as your distinguished guests just mentioned, yet, yes, we have problems. We have structural problems, wrong practices uh, on the part of the government and the private sectors and the citizens. And I don't think this is just about sanctions This is just uh, or just, just about infrastructures or policies. I think people have to also cooperate. Many people, many traders here try to evade tax. They don't want to pay tax, so they smuggle goods and services to this country to make more money uh, as much as possible. They also manipulate the foreign currency market. The, 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 over the past two days, we have seen a lot of fluctuations in the market with regard to the value of the Iranian currency. Yesterday, we had, uh, we had, a, f we had a fall, a, a, a huge drop in the value of U.S. dollar. Now, today, we have a huge uh, rise in the value of dollars. You can see that many people are trying to manipulate the economic situation and the political situation in Iran and the United States, which is happening right now. So I think uh, it's a very long, long process, and many people have to cooperate with each other. But, but, uh, but we, ha we also have to include the fact uh, that we are now in the middle of a global economic downturn. If the United States doesn't fix its economy, if the situation doesn't improve in Europe, I don't see any future for Iranian economy in, in, in a short period of time. We have to wait to see them perform well before we could do anything here. Ali Azatiar, how does the uh, Iranian economy affect relations with the U.S.? Well, there are a number of uh, points of contention between Iran and the U.S. Political and social obviously exist, as the 2009 and most recent elections will have demonstrated. But really, the reason why Iran is coming to the negotiating table now is the economy. It's getting progressively worse. And Iranian policymakers are starting to really feel the pinch from the Iranian populace. 
And I think that that is really the be all and end all for, for why Iran has come to the negotiating table because if you consider uh, politically, while Iran doesn't have necessarily uh, great relations with its neighbors or the international community, it's much more comfortable than it would have been five or even ten years ago in the aftermath of the Iraq invasion. The paranoia um, is uh, sort of subsided for regime change. So the economy is paramount. Your average Iranian has difficulty buying goods and making ends meet because of the, the collapse of the currency, which is a result of the bureaucratic mismanagement that exists. So uh, it's really second to none as far as what's bringing uh, Iran to the negotiating table. Ambassador, your thoughts? How does the economy play with U.S. relations? You know, it's very, inter uh, um, it's very interesting. Uh, you see, obviously, you have what you have in Iran. You have a political elite that has been in power uh, since 1979. Uh, typically, what happens with this elite, and it's happened in Iran, is that this elite gets more and more out of touch with the realities of the or of the ordinary citizens. Perhaps. We are encouraged that President Rouhani received from the Iranian people a mandate to pursue a more moderate course. The roadblocks may prove to be too great, but I firmly believe the diplomatic path must be tested. Notwithstanding all difficulties and challenges, I am deeply optimistic about the future. I have no doubt that the future will be bright with the entire world solidly rejecting violence and extremism. In that clip, that we just heard. President Obama talked about roadblocks and President Rouhani talked about difficulties and challenges. So let's talk about the internal forces, the politics in play in both countries. And I want to start with you, Ambassador Lindbergh, and go back to the words of President Rouhani talking about new possibilities and they will not build a nuclear bomb. Is this a step in the right, right direction? Is this a breakthrough? It's a change. A change. Uh, it's a change from what we've heard about the last uh, in the last 34 years. Even the use of the word prudence and moderation, those were words uh, you haven't heard around uh, from an Iranian president or a high-level official. Those were um, uh, those were forbidden words uh, for a long time. I mean, the worst thing you could call someone uh, in the Iranian in the, in the Iranian the bear pit the, of Iranian politics was a moderate. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was condemned. That is new. There are some new things. There are some new things in his speech. When he said, um, "I listened to what President Obama said," that sounds small, but it's new. Words you haven't heard in the past. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Ali Azad Tr. Is this a breakthrough? A true breakthrough? I think it's a breakthrough. For, if for no other reason than the fact that there were no surprises. It really left the door open. It was an amicable sort of approach by both presidents. Uh, not a very, uh, you know, it was a sort of non-committal by both presidents that they didn't lay out sort of what concessions they were willing to make, but that's totally natural. So I do agree with the ambassador that it, it's very much, uh, if you, you know, sort of take it in stark contrast with uh, a speech by Ahmadinejad in front of the General Assembly and the sort of uh, rounds that that would have made and the walkouts, this really left the door open for the highest level negotiations that will be taking place between the two countries' foreign ministers soon. Uh, and so in that sense, I think it was both a, a success and a breakthrough, yes. Gunba Nadiri, what has the reaction been out of Iran on both President uh, uh, Rouhani's words and President Obama's words? Well, I'm afraid I, I really want to start on a positive note and, and say that things are going to change for good, for better. But I don't think that is going to happen. As I just mentioned, today the value of U.S. dollar has gone up because of what Mr. Rouhani said yesterday at the United Nations General Assembly. He said that he is not going to uh, retreat from Iran's nuclear right. And he, uh, what he said that he has, he doesn't have the power to, to dismantle Iran's nuclear program. Even the leadership here doesn't have that kind of power and authority. Any person, any politician who dares to do that is going to be ousted here in the Iranian capital, Tehran. If you had listened carefully to what Mr. Rouhani was saying, he was sweating when he was talking. This means that he was under immense internal pressure. Many groups here don't like to have relations with the United States, and they have many reasons for that. They don't trust the United States. Yes, the United States government also doesn't trust the Iranian government. I don't want to blame the U.S. government, but the thing is that the wall of trust is very high, and it is not going to collapse overnight. In, in Gunbar, I want to get to the president's word, President Obama's words. What has the reaction been out of Tehran? Well, 
Iranians always welcome dialogue. They chose, they elected a moderate president because they are sick and tired of dispute with the United States over Iran's nuclear energy program. Iran doesn't have anything to hide here. Iran just wants some kind of respect and mutual understanding between, between, between these two countries. They want some kind of trust. You know, if that, that thing exists, Iran is more than willing to open up its nuclear program for bigger and broader uh, and more scrutinized uh, international inspection. Iran doesn't have anything to hide. Iran is not worried about any, you know, hidden secret aspects of its nuclear program. The only thing that Iran doesn't like is this so-called, you know, all options are on the table, including military. And, and, and the good news is that Iranians were very happy yesterday when Mr. Obama did not re repeat this rhetoric of all options are on the table. And that's a good sign. We, we we are hopeful. Iranians welcome relations with the, with the United States. They miss this kind right. of good relations with the United States. But I don't think this is going to happen overnight, as, as Mr. Obama himself also mentioned yesterday. Ambassador, I want to bring it back to you. What are the internal challenges President Obama faces? Internal, cha uh, um, internal challenges. Uh, well, uh, what we are seeing uh, is on both sides is nothing more than the practice of diplomacy. The problem is that neither, uh, both in Tehran and in Washington, people um, have forgotten how to do it, apparently. We and the Iranians have not practiced diplomacy with each other uh, for 34 years. So we have to sort of pull out the old books, dust, the, dust them off, and figure out how to do it. What we know how to do is call each other names. Um, impose penalties, insult each other, threaten each uh, 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 threaten each other. Uh, now we have to do some. Now we have to do something new. We have to listen to each other. We have to have patience. I agree with uh, uh, with, with with my colleague, Mr. Nadiri, that there are going to be setbacks. There are going to be difficulties. Uh, we've been in a deep freeze for 34 years. That doesn't thaw out uh, overnight with one speech, with one statement, with one hand with with one meeting. Um, and so patience, listening, forbearance, all the tools of diplomacy that I'm afraid have grown rusty over these last three decades. And I want to talk about where Israel falls into the mix as well as Saudi Arabia coming up in just a moment. We're going to take a short break. When we come right back, more on the geographic and strategic influences in play in the broader Middle East. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside Story. Just one look at a map and it becomes abundantly clear how important Iran is as a regional power on its eastern border, Afghanistan, to the west, Iraq, two countries where the U.S. has been deeply involved. And not too far away is Syria, where a proxy war has left more than 100,000 dead. I want to continue the conversation now with Ambassador Limbert. Where do we go from here with Iran and Syria? The U.S. has to come to the table and meet with Iran. Uh in a, in, a, in a reasonable world, if we lived in a reasonable world, we and the Iranians uh, would be talking about Syria together. It's clear. Uh, Iran has to be part of the, of the solution there. And the interesting thing is that we ha there are common interests involved. Uh, one is both, both we and the Iranians uh, do not want to see a Sunni extremist group dominate, uh, groups dominating Syria. Uh, and Al-Qaeda influence connected groups coming to power in Damascus. Uh, both also share a revulsion uh, against the use of chemical weapons. The Iranians, it seems to me, are in a particularly uh, important place to denounce the use of chemical weapons since they themselves were the victims of that during the Iran-Iraq war and at that time when Saddam used the chemical weapons against them, uh, the international community was silent. Israel will assert whatever influence they have to hold back cooperation with Iran. Uh, I don't accept your assumption. Your your assumption there. Yes, there are with, within Israel, as there are in other pl uh, other places. There is the, there are extreme right gr groups. There are what we call what I might call the Iran haters and the chest thump, uh, uh, and the chest thumpers. But if I could point, I could uh, repeat what the newspaper Haaretz said. Said. Uh, remember, APAC is not is, is not Israel. There is a, as I understand it, there is a vigorous debate within is, within Israel over just these uh, just these cases, and there's a great division of, of of opinion. The interesting thing that's happened is that now Ahmadinejad is gone. Ahmadinejad, for the Israeli right, was the gift who kept on giving. 
because he allowed this fear-mongering to go on. Now he's gone, the Israelis, or at least the Israeli right, has lost, its, uh, has lost what many Iranians uh, called their best agent in terror. Gunbar Nadiri, I want to get your take. Where do we move from here when it comes to dealing with Syria and Iran and also the influence from Israel? Well, uh, Iran, as the, the new government has mentioned on several occasions, it, uh, they don't have any war with Israel. They don't seek any confrontation with Israel. But unfortunately, this kind of paranoia and wall of the mistrust also exists between Iran and Israel. They think that they are somehow conspiring each other to dismantle each other, I don't know, to uh, vaporize each other, annihilate each other, but that is not going to happen at all. Iran doesn't threaten any country. Mr. Rouhani yesterday made it absolutely clear that Iran doesn't pose any threat to any regional country, including Israel. But with regard to, to Syria, Iran has a lot of interests in that country. We have hundreds of thousands of Iranians who are married to Syrians, and we have many Syrian nationals in, the, uh, in, in Iranian cities and towns. So you cannot s s separate Iran via, from Syria. We are, going, we are going to live together, just like we have been living with uh, Iraq and uh, Lebanon through under, under similar circumstances, including Afghanistan. They need to include Iran uh, in any future talks that regards any kind of you know, peaceful solution to the Syrian crisis. But, but as I said, I'm trying to be positive just, just for the moment. Today, the, the opposition group, the, the so-called Free Syrian Army, said that if Iran attends any peace talks with, uh, with regard to Syria, they are going to boycott uh, that, that kind of meeting. So you see, this is a very complicated sure. matter. Ali Azad TR, if diplomacy does prevail, what does this mean for the Middle East? Well, I would consider sort of the, the position of uh, Syria in, in that question. At the end of the day, if you consider that Syria was the one country that supported Iran in the Iran-Iraq war, essentially, it's a very important ally for Iran. And Iran, in a lot of ways, um, although what's happening in Syria is absolutely tragic, Iran has come out a bit of a winner given that Assad has been one of the few survivors uh, of the region's uprisings. And so, um, you know, speaking about red lines, it's, it's interesting to note that Netanyahu used the same language last year uh, in the General Assembly uh, to, to refer to Iran's nuclear program, uh, and the international community essentially failed to act on Assad's violation of those red lines. Basically, what, what that all means for diplomacy is that, at the moment, both sides tend to be in a more or less um, set position where Iran is uh, is much more sort of stable and confident about its position. Uh, the United States sort of needs a, a bit of luck in the diplomatic arena and they may be able to help each other in a lot of ways both economically and diplomatically and what it would mean would be a potential uh, scaling back of tensions in places like Lebanon, absolutely in Syria, more cooperation in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and uh, have wider implications for, for the rest of the region as well. We're out of time, but this is certainly a conversation that will continue. I want to thank our guests for being here today. Gentlemen, thank you. That's it from the team in Washington, D.C., and from me, Thomas Drayton. Thanks for watching.